So, I'm trying to think, we met about five years ago. We did, yes. What have you been up to since then? <laughs> Trying to save the planet through reducing waste, still. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to save the planet is quite a big ambition, but probably right now it feels more acute than ever. Yes, I mean, it does, doesn't it? We've got sort of fires, floods, it's all feeling very biblical. Yeah, so earlier I was trying to save the planet. Yes. How? By tackling the problem of waste in our homes and local communities. Yeah. And as you might recall, we do that by connecting people with their neighbours so you can give, get, buy, sell, lend and borrow yeah. everyday household items. And then also you can give away your spare food. Are people, daft question perhaps, but given the cost of living crisis or, or the inflation of prices. Yeah. I would imagine it's obviously still a huge, I know that food waste is still a huge problem, but are people slightly more conscious, I suppose, of food waste because of how much it costs? Yes, I would say so. Um, so we've seen some really interesting trends in terms of how people are thinking about food, the value of food in the past couple of years. So COVID was the first real big shock to the system mm. because prior to COVID, households were throwing away £14 billion pounds sterling of perfectly good food every single year that could be eaten. And then when COVID hit, you might remember in those early days, we saw those photographs of empty supermarket shelves. And I think for many people, that was the first time they actually stopped and reflected about what happens if I can't get access to food. And then lockdowns happened and food waste in the home reduced by about 20 to 25% during that period of time, which is mm. obviously fantastic for the planet, fantastic for people's wallets. But then unfortunately, after lockdowns were released, we went back to our you know, life as usual, our wasteful ways, yeah. and food waste in the home sort of pinged back up again. Now, obviously, we've got the cost of living crisis going on, and I haven't yet seen any official data, but certainly, anecdotally, a lot of people are really struggling to get by, and that means that you do really look very carefully at anything that you are throwing away. The flip side of that, is that the demand for not just food, but also household items on Olio has increased dramatically right. over the past couple of years. So you know, 12, 18 months ago, a typical household item would have been requested in four hours. Now it's been requested in two hours. And a typical food listing is being requested in less than 20 minutes. So our number one challenge really is there's no shortage of people who want to pick up free stuff from their neighbors. Our number one challenge is encouraging people to take 10 seconds and that's all it takes to add their spare to the app so that they can give it a second life with someone in their community. Olio, I think I read online that it's 67 countries. Is that right? We've had items successfully shared in 63 countries 63. so far. Yeah, I'm just gonna get some milk. Um, and yeah. how, many, how many users then, roughly? So we have had over 7 million people join Olio so far yeah. and together our community has shared over 130 million portions of food and also 9 million household items as well yeah. and that has had an environmental impact equivalent to taking over 450 million car miles off the road and we've also saved over 17 billion litres of water. So, Which is they're all big numbers. They I suppose are it's big difficult. numbers, yes. Is that, <laughs> enough, is that enough milk that's, that's for you? Perfect. And do you want yeah, any yeah. sugar? No, like I said, no, not precious. That's, that's okay, perfect. Okay, excellent. Yeah, it's, it's, I suppose it's kind of, those numbers are so big that you begin to kind of struggle to comprehend. But the yeah. fact that the UN, this is, might be slightly, I don't know how you feel about this, but I read that the UN had described Olio as a beacon for humanity. Yes. Is I suppose, <laughs> <laughs> which I don't think you should kind of nervous yeah. laughter, slight kind of, that's yeah. quite an accolade. No, it's incredible. Yeah, it was definitely one of the most magical moments on the Olio journey to <laughs> receive that award, that's for sure. But it definitely puts those numbers in context about the impact. It, it does. And another way to put the numbers into, uh, into context, so often when we talk about the climate impact of waste, but specifically wasting food, yeah. uh, globally we throw away a third of all the food we produce each year. It's worth over a trillion US dollars. And if food waste were to be a country, it would be the third largest source of greenhouse gas emissions after the USA and China, which is why something mm. like the UN sees Olio, this super simple, scalable solution as being a beacon of hope. But to put that environmental uh, impact into slightly more context, 
the carbon emissions from throwing away one kilogram of food, so let's imagine the food you'd put in your food waste caddy, yeah. is equivalent to landfilling how many plastic bottles do you think? So carbon emissions from food waste in this is equivalent to the carbon emissions from landfilling how many plastic bottles? Take a guess. I mean, I have no idea, but 10? I, I, I really have no okay. idea. You are spectacularly wrong. 25,000 plastic wow. bottles. So because basically food waste is incredibly carbon intensive, you've got yeah. a land mass larger than China is used to grow food every year that's never eaten. You have all of the energy and the resources that go, you know, the fertilizer and all the tractors course, and the yes. plowing and the harvesting. You then got the incredibly long supply chain that food goes through, the refrigeration, the packaging, um, distribution, etc. And then when a third of all the food we produce each year gets thrown away, the majority of it ends up in landfill. And when food decomposes without access to oxygen in landfill, it creates methane. And methane is over 25 times more deadly than CO2. So that is why solving the problem of food waste has been identified by Project Drawdown as the number one most powerful solution to solve the climate crisis. That's shown off my staggering ignorance. Hopefully I'm fairly typical. And, like, and I don't, like, hopefully, and yeah. obviously it would be bad if I am, but at the same time, yeah. I, I would imagine that a lot of people are on, a, on a, an education journey. They are. So it's really shocking to most people. Most people, when you talk to them about food waste, they understand that it's morally wrong, but they have no idea how environmentally devastating it is. And I think that's because food is natural. It's organic. It comes mm. from the earth. How bad can throwing it away be? And we just don't connect the dots and understand all the resources that go into producing that food. And the other massive misconception in this space is when you talk about food waste, most people assume that the majority of food waste takes place at a supermarket. Yeah. And in reality, supermarkets and retail stores are responsible for just 2% of all food waste. And we in our homes, we are responsible for half. I kind of say hopefully because there's often that thing with the climate crisis at the minute where people feel a little bit like, what, what, what can I do? What can yeah. I actually do? But the, yeah. here is actually, you're painting a scenario where someone yeah. can do something that does have a significant impact. It isn't small mm. actions. Because often, look, I'll, I'll be honest with, with my wife and I, we, we often say, yeah, but it's down to the government. It's kind of out of yeah, our yeah. hands. Yeah. But that is con countering that point. It is. So this is a message that we have at Olio, which is that we have so much power as individuals uh, in our homes. So 65% of all greenhouse gas emissions are generated as a direct result of household consumption. Yeah. So that's you, that's me. And actually we don't have to wait for governments. We don't have to wait for businesses who we know are not doing anywhere near what they need to be doing. We can take the power into our own hands and doing something as simple as stopping throwing away food as you know, buying secondhand, making sure that you're really using every single resource that you have in your home properly. It's an incredibly powerful way to make a difference. And we have a really simple philosophy at Olio, which is that it was billions of small actions that caused the climate crisis in the first place, you and me and all of us. Yeah. And so by the same logic, billions of small actions are what is going to get us out of it. Given the significance of the work that you're doing, yep. and the lights that has been shone upon it by organisations such as the UN, I would imagine that you have been able to raise money quite easily. And that is probably naive in itself. How much money have you raised so far? <laughs> well, despite all the odds, <laughs> we have managed to raise just over $50 million. Mm -hmm. But it has been gruelling, soul-destroying, exhausting experience that I'm still honestly quite traumatised by. Why has it been all of those things? Oof, where do you start? It has been all of those things, not just because of the rejections that you get, but because it feels like I am speaking Japanese often. Like a lot of the investors who are almost exclusively male do not understand the problem that we are trying to solve. They're not excited about the problem that we're trying to solve and they don't really kind of get the solution either. So we have certainly found that female founders, uh, sorry, female investors and also 
Investors of colour are people who understand the importance of the climate crisis, the urgency with which we need to solve it, and also the power that community-based solutions can bring to the table. And that is something that a typical investor that we're encountering often just can't get their heads around. This is something we could talk about <laughs> at great length, yeah. so why don't we... Be comfortable. Grab a seat, yes. You talked about the rejections being traumatic. How did you deal with the rejections? With difficulty initially, but I've had lots of practice now and I've done a couple of things that have really helped. So the first thing is I always bear in mind a piece that I read by Brian Chesky, who's one of the founders of Airbnb. And I can remember him saying that he received 33 rejections, I think it was, before he closed a round of financing. So I always remember that it is a numbers game. I've also learned not to take it personally. It's, you know, fundraising is like dating in the same way that I'm not perfect <laughs> for every you know, man on the planet in the same way Olio isn't perfect for every investor. And the other thing that I've done is really reframe how I go into fundraising. And so now I go in assuming that it's a no until I hear a resounding hell yes, when, can I, when and where can I write the check? And I think that's really, really important because certainly in your early days fundraising, you go in hoping that every single conversation is going to lead to a yes. And if you go in with that mindset, then you're just setting yourself up for disappointment. Even though you're aware of the odds that you're trying to, to overcome, did, did you ever challenge any of those rejections? No. No? No, I didn't. Because if someone does not want to invest in you, then that relationship is never going to work. If on day one, they're not 150% all in, that relationship will not work. So no. Um, but I took learnings from every rejection and some of those learnings were a reflection on myself and all the business. But many of those learnings were just a reflection of what the criteria and requirements were of that investor and of that fund. And it really does reinforce the need to do your due diligence and do your homework nice and early. And in those initial conversations, make sure you really, really understand what those investors are actually looking for. You say what those investors are looking for. Part of that unconscious bias is un undoubtedly the, the makeup of that founding team. Mm -hmm. When we were talking to, to Paul Miller at Bethel Green Ventures, he talked about two pence in every pound going to, to female founders. That's on a good year. <laughs> <laughs> Did yourself and Sasha ever discuss that? Did you ever go, should we bring a male into the room simply because of the, the statistics and the odds? Yes, yeah, so we've always been well aware of the odds and they are deeply stacked against us. It had never crossed my mind to bring a man into the room until a meeting I had, it was about three years ago, there were five female founders on this call and we were having a private conversation around fundraising and I had this horrific moment of realisation when I discovered that the other four women had all resorted to or in the process of bringing in a man to help with the fundraising and I had that moment of thinking, am I the only moron that's trying to do this by myself? And I had a fairly sort of angst ridden 24 hours as I really debated what is in the best interest of Olio and my business, should we be bringing a man into the equation or not? And I, I'm afraid I just kind of, I just couldn't quite bring myself to do that. I thought I'm just gonna die fighting and die trying. So we didn't bring a man in, but a lot of female founders do have to resort to that. Given those learnings then, what do you think was key to the success? Because undoubtedly you have had success. You've raised a substantial amount of money. What mm. do you put that down to? Well, first of all, you've, you've got to have an investable business. So that's an absolute non-negotiable. Beyond that, though, how can you ensure that your female founded investable business actually gets the investment? I think there are several things you need to do. So first of all, you do need to prepare yourself mentally for the fact that you are raising against the odds. Mm -hmm. You then need to 
really drill down into what both those conscious and unconscious biases against you are, and then you need to take proactive steps to try and preempt those. So for example, we all know that female founders are assumed to be less commercial and less ambitious. And so what we have done at Olio is we've always made sure that in our pitch decks, for example, we really, really put to bed any conscious or unconscious biases. There might be nice and early in the deck to demonstrate that we absolutely are commercial, we absolutely are ambitious. And I think it was on our second raise, I realized that we needed to establish our credibility as a founding team fast. And one of the quickest shortcuts to doing that was to have the very first page of the deck be a whole series of logos of the sort of seals of approval of institutions that Sasha and I had either studied at or worked at that demonstrated that we were two founders who were to be taken seriously. You talk, you talk about conscious and unconscious bias. Yep. One of those unconscious bias that has come up through the course of making this is the fact that um, VCs ten, there is a tendency for VCs rather to ask female founders questions that are negative as opposed to questions that give an opportunity to be positive on, mm -hmm. on male counterparts, of male counterparts. How conscious of that are you? Because you talk about preparing, obviously, for those, for those pitch meetings. Extremely conscious. So I watched a TED talk by a lady called Dana Kanzi, and she did some research to understand why is it that female founders don't get the investment. And one of the core factors that she uncovered was precisely that, the fact that female founders are asked prevention questions, so the mm -hmm. negative questions, and male founders are asked the promotion questions, the positive questions. And I can absolutely attest to the fact that fundraising is a barrage of those prevention or those negative questions. And the solution to that is to answer those negative or prevention questions with a positive or a promotion response. And that's is a really, really crit critical trick to have in your toolbox. Should the onus be on female founders? I mean, obviously, it stands to reason <laughs> that you, you, you prepare and then the, the try onus, and counter. The onus should not be on us to have to do any of these no. things. But if we want to get our businesses funded today, then we absolutely do need to do these things. How did you find the firms to approach? So I think of fundraising a bit like sort of following the spider's web. So when I'm fundraising, well, actually, even before I fundraise, I am already talking to everybody I meet, whether it be someone in a supermarket or a bar or in a meeting that we are going to be fundraising. And you really open yourself up to networking and connections. And then every single person that I meet who is in the space, I ask them for onward connections, including investors as well. And so that way, I'm never having to do cold introductions. It's always warm introductions. It's just following that spider's web. I should say that before I started in this space, I had no network. I didn't have anyone who could do any warm introducing for me. Um, so you had to kind of build that network yourself. Do you, do you share that with, with other female founders? Do you kind of go, Here's, here is a network of friendly firms that you can approach where, where you will actually be taken seriously and a lot of that groundwork that perhaps otherwise you might have to do has already been done for you. How I tend to approach it is if any founder, female or founder of colour or someone from a difficult socioeconomic background, anyone who might be considered a diverse founder, I will always give them half an hour of my time. Mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time reviewing people's pitch decks, giving them feedback on that. And then for the ones that I feel like I know investors who would be interested in their business, I then make that warm connection myself. So every week I'm making warm connections for other founders to investors who I think could be a good fit for them. I think over the last couple of years in the technology industry, the outward discussion has been that there is progress being made with regards to more women coming into the industry, more diversity, perhaps more equity. But looking at this particular issue around funding, it seems that actually it's getting harder. Mm. You're a successful female founder in the industry. What's your perspective? The reality is that the numbers have refused to budge. For years and years and years, female founders get generally 1% of all VC investment on a good year, or if you're looking at Europe, perhaps instead of the UK, we might get 2%. And 
There's been an awful lot of sort of hand wringing in mm -hmm. the industry about why this is. And there has been good progress made amongst the VC firms bringing in female talent at a more junior level. And that's a fantastic first step, but it's still not getting us female founders any closer to the money because the problem is that we then pitch to the more junior female investors. They love our business. They get excited. They then go on and pitch to their pale male and stale investment committee and they suffer exactly the same rejection and knockback that we do. And so I am extremely clear that there is only one thing that will solve the female founding funding gap and that is we need investment committees that are truly diverse, that have a 50% representation of women on them and that will be transformative. So is that is that fixing the existing system as opposed to some how, how does that how does that work in practice so you've got an exist you know one of the big vc firms that underwrites yeah. series if, c and d yeah scale i mean series. If, if you if you look at and i think the bvca provides does reports on this in terms of female investors that have check writing ability i think they comprise only 10 to 15 percent mm -hmm. of all investors and we need that to be 50 percent so you know, it's kind of it's not really my job or the owner shouldn't be on me to solve this problem for the VC industry. But absolutely, if I were in the industry, I would be setting targets and a time frame in which my investment committee was truly 50-50. And these investors might have to start getting creative. They might need to perhaps bring in some outsiders um, and have kind of non-exec type input into some of their investment committees. I'm sure there are lots of things that they can do to solve this problem but it does need solving yeah i mean i'm just thinking because because you know in preparation for this we spoke to the newton venture program they're trying to get more female vcs into the community you look at statistics from the states there are more female vcs although the numbers are still fairly insignificant mm. but the funding gaps still get bigger so are those female vcs empowered do they feel no then they're not and, and the problem is that if you have one female and you have nine men, you might look at that on paper and say you've got 10% female representation. But the reality is that that one woman is having to mask herself enormously and comply and fit in in order to be able to survive. And actually, she probably can only allow 10% of her femaleness to genuinely be demonstrated. So actually, you've only got kind of 1% female in that scenario. And to solve it, we've got to move significantly beyond the token woman or the token person of colour, we have got to get as close to 50% as we can. That is when things will start to change. That is when things that often as a female founder to me are common sense, for example, that businesses should have to combine purpose with profit. These sorts of things um, at the moment are, are very controversial when you're in a predominantly male room. The minute you switch the mix and you have a much more even balance again that then is um, that female perspective is represented and it's not seen as a point of contention some of the solutions that it, it, you were quite clear for you this is the 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 main way to to tackle this issue during the course of making this yeah and, and i should i should say that comes from experience so and certainly in the early days of founding olio you know three quarters of our cap table came from female investors and when I would get introduced to an investor or hear about a, a firm the first thing I would do is go onto their about us page and look at the team yep. page specifically and if I saw a good representation of diversity on that page I knew that my probability of success was infinitely higher than if I saw a very, very homogenous page of people. Is that often transparent? I mean, when you, when you go on those pages, yeah. is that information easy to find? It, it is, yes. Gen generally, there's our, there's a sort of an hour team page with all their mugshots, and you can very quickly at a glance assess your probability of success. Is it easy to find out where the fund money is coming from? Because one, one suggestion no. <laughs> was that as more independently wealthy women yeah. exist and those funds begin to get their funding sources from a more diverse portfolio that yeah. that will naturally then you know the, the people putting their money into the fund will go well hang on a minute who, 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 are, we, who are we funding here yeah that, that's absolutely correct so the two challenges here one it's completely opaque 
as to where these funds are actually getting their financing from. And at the moment, it is predominantly from sort of LPs who are white and male as well. So who are not pushing as hard as we would like on the VCs to make sure that they are um, backing diverse founders. Do you think there's less of a problem amongst angel founders than VCs? I mean, I know it's a slightly different pool of people, but I, I mean, one person did say to me, look, angels, from an early stage investment, angels are incredibly important. You shouldn't ignore them. Mm. But I imagine there's still similar systemic problems. It feels like a long time ago since we were um, doing angel investing, but certainly my, my observation is there does seem to be more diversity at the angel mm -hmm. level. Uh, and that is because yeah, we, we, there are more female angels now. In the States, there's some alarming developments around uh, uh, legal proceedings against the Fearless Fund, um, where there's a challenge to a, um, a pool of money that is being ring-fenced for black female founders, um, perhaps contravening the 1866 Equalities Act and... Uh, that somehow it's in, it, it, it contravenes um, contract law. I have spoken to female founders in the States who are incredibly concerned this could open the floodgates. When you hear news like that as a female founder, what, what tends to be your reaction? My first thought is, where are the people who are suing the current VC industry <laughs> for um, the lack of uh, support and investment into diverse founders? Uh, that is very concerning. Um, I mean, honestly, I don't know what more, more to say no. <laughs> beyond that. It's very concerning. We'll have to see if that um, comes over here in the UK. What, what can the government do to, to kind of enshrine, I suppose, investment well, into diverse founders? The government is a significant investor in funds themselves, and so a, a very powerful solution that they can do is they can make sure that those funds are then being onwardly invested in funds that have criteria around investing in diverse founders and also I would argue in investing in businesses that have profit with purpose at the very heart of them. One of the most exhausting things about it is you're just faced by this wall of just male cynicism, of disbelief about the problem that you're trying to solve, disbelief around your solution and I also feel that as female founders, we're not really given the license to think big mm. or to be ambitious. And that's really frustrating. In the face of male cynicism, we always talk broadly when talking about women in tech about the need for allies. What does an ally in this space look like? So an ally is a male investor who listens very carefully to the problem that you are describing and does their due diligence and homework to make sure they properly understand it and they really understand your community that you are solving that problem for. And most importantly, there's someone who is prepared to go against the grain and actually invest money in female founders. What's your advice to female founders? You're obviously someone that has been successful. You know, um, Ariana is kind of very much at the beginning of her, her journey who we've focused on in this film, when you're speaking to someone who's pre-seed or coming up to series A, what do you tell them? Well, the first thing I say to them is you're not alone. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be an incredibly lonely journey and it's very easy to think that you're the only person that has trodden this path before. There are so many female founders now who are wanting to scale businesses and so raise funding. I definitely encourage you, therefore, to reach out and create a peer group so that you can support one another, share introductions and commiserate. Um, the other thing I would say is know the odds, but then prepare yourself to defeat those odds. And that definitely requires you to be fairly clear eyed about the biases that do exist against you, but just to build up a bit of an action plan to counter each one of those biases one by one. And you need to do that from everything, from kind of how you structure your pitch deck to what you wear to walk into the room and everything in between. And just look, as, as, a, as a final point, because the one thing I wanted to avoid was, let's talk about this, but here's a whole load of talk that doesn't really 
add anything significantly new. And I know it's hard to do that. As we said, we've been talking for a long time as an industry without really seeing progress. What do you think is, is if there could be one or two actions that could actually make a tangible difference, what do you think those are? There's just one thing for me. If we want to get more money to female founders, we have got to have diversity amongst the gatekeepers of capital. We need to have 50-50 investment committees. And that needs to be... Within the next five years. And, and who, who makes that happen, in your opinion? Because it's not fair to, to assume the, that that's going to be female founders putting pressure on no, and VCs themselves probably no, won't change. No, that's going to be a combination of the LPs and the VCs themselves. Yeah. Tessa, thank you for your time. Thank you.